Good morning and welcome. This is Sunrise Daily. I'm Ayo Makinde. Rise and shine. It's a beautiful Monday morning here in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm Kaya Deoki Kyoto. Thought we already rose to shine. It's, 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 a, you know, it's an expression. Oh, right? really? It's, it's like a motivation. Rise and shine. Okay. And then it just hits you now. Okay, there's a lot to do today. There's so many amazing things to amaze one the day, world with. One day, one week, one month, and one year. W when is that census thing? It's meant to be this year. This well, at least it's, it's budgeted for, as it were. And, you know, let me just add to the question you just asked <laughs> me, perhaps a bigger one. How many are we in Nigeria? Um, if you ask Honorable Bob, you say don't let go, don't, don't don't let's go, go there, there, right? Because for a lot of people, we're not more than, what, 150 million or 160. I, I know we had that conversation at some point. I think it was last year. You know, Mark Pway touched on it and we said, you know, we're going to talk about this sometime in the future. You know, we're still keeping scores, Lagos and Abuja. So this morning, <laughs> we're looking into that, really. And the, the question, I know the MBS has said that we're just about over 200 million, I think 206. But don't forget, they're always estimates. The last time we conducted a population population census in Nigeria was 2006 and at that time the figure came down to 140 million with Lagos and Kano almost tied. Kano 9.4 million, Lagos 9 million. But ever since then, what, how many years after now? This is um, quite some years. You know, when it comes to years, the math just disappears. <laughs> <but> <laughs> 2006, 2006, 2006, years, that's actually. 10 years. Uh -huh, that's yeah. 16 years mm -hmm. after. Lagos has since moved to 20 million estimates mm -hmm. and Kano also. So. The question as to how 9.4 million, 9 million became 20 million in just less than 20 years. And, you know, it bogs the mind of a lot of people. So why do we need to do a population census? I mean, the, 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 the reasons are nearly endless. But another question is, coming a year before the election, but we try to condense all of this into this report so that Nigerians will know at least uh, what to discuss regarding this population census. So take a listen. I'll be back. Deploying technologies like the by Nigeria is preparing for another national housing and population census, 16 years after the last exercise. Although no date has been fixed, the National Population Commission has fixed the exercise for this year less than a year before the 2023 general elections. The conduct of boot exercises comes with massive deployment of personnel, technology, and perhaps more importantly, funding. Both bodies are preparing the technology and the personnel for the conduct of the exercise. For instance, the Independent National Electoral Commission has been deploying technologies like the Bimodal Voter Accreditation System for elections, and the 2022 Electoral Act now allows the Commission to electronically transmit results. The National Population Commission has completed the enumeration area demarcation, a methodology that divides the entire country into smaller units for easy conduct of the exercise. Out of the 774 local governments, I will be able to demarcate um, 772. Only two are uh, outstanding and some pockets of areas uh, that uh, could not be accessed during uh, and because of the insecurity challenge we have. However, there are other technological options for the exercise in view of the burden of conducting both exercises within a year. One of the ways to do with this issue is to ensure that National Identity Management uh, Commission is, you know, uh, supported to continue to have a continuous, you know, a registration of Nigerians. With that, you can quietly actually even do your census without politicization. Funding is another critical part of both exercises. President Muhammad Buhari has earmarked the sum of 190 billion naira for the conduct of the 2022 census. Whereas, the Independent National Electoral Commission had proposed to spend 305 billion naira for the conduct of the 2023 general elections. Many Nigerians have been wondering, why are you doing election? I mean, why are you doing census when it is just a year to the general election? There are going to be some challenges, logistic challenges, and for the fact that you know, uh, it is an election period. Some people will give 
meaning and interpretation and will have a negative feeling that uh, you are doing it for some reasons. One, uh, because you wanted to use public taxpayers' money to run election, personal elections of some individual. So the best way is to organize census so that there will be justification for spending money. If the plan for both exercises proceeds as scheduled, it will not be the first time. In 2006, census was conducted in March and the results were published in December. A few months later, specifically April 14 and 21, Nigerians went to the polls for the 2007 general elections. However, controversies trailed the outcome of the census back then. Hopefully, these exercises will be delivered as planned, devoid of controversies. We're really in a hurry to get into that, but um, the, the conversations around this census thing, let's have a brief one on it. Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think one is why we need to do a census. Why did it take us this long? Apparently, we, the last one we did was 2006. Before then, it was 1991. And they would say you should do this every 10 years, right? So it took us 15 years first, now 16 years. And who knows what will happen. Uh, but, but the point for me is uh, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about politicization of this whole thing. I think we need to actually get this right once and for all. Yes, it might be close to elections, but then they are quick to point to how we had it in 2006. If we need to make plans for this country, if we need to know how many people are in poverty, I mean, the NBS says just near 50%, but what does that come to in numbers really? So can put a figure to these things. I think it's important to do it. Yes, it's before election year, but let's get this over with, absolutely. Papa, any take? Oh, yes, I can. It's just that our music is so much louder than our voices. Uh, good morning, gentlemen, and a beautiful welcome to you to the Federal Capital Territory. A lot of things to, uh, to ponder on, and I think one of them will be petrol and how it affects our population, because there'll be questions as to um, how did the one billion liters of an NPC finish quickly? Is it that, you know, maybe they were still importing based on the number of people they thought we had, or number of, I don't know if we'll be counting cars as well, number of cars they thought we had, or number of people generally, because don't forget that in some places, electricity supply has been pretty poor, and so people have to depend on these alternative sources of uh, power, including their generators. And if you do not have the right number of people, you see, if you're wondering how these things are related, if you, do not have the, if you don't know how many people you're providing for, you have a problem. Uh, just last week, we had a conversation with the governor of Nasara. We we're taking, taking him on, on the communities around Abuja. And he was telling me that I think for the whole of Nasara, I think the, the, the figure was placed at 1.5 million. And he was saying that just in the communities adjoining the federal capital territory uh, around his, in his own state, you know, which borders the FCT, that they estimate that they have already 1.5 million people there. How much more the entire state? So these figures are, are really, really old. And if you do not have figures, how do you plan? It's like organizing a party. You think that 200 people are going to come and then 1,500 people show up. What sort of party are you going to have? A total disaster. So I'm talking about parties. See what happened over the weekend. Did you see what happened? Someone distributing petrol at a party. But... Hey, let's, let's stay with the issue. If you do not plan, you plan to fail. That's the truth of the matter. And if political leaders are coming into office in the next year, uh, the following year, and um, they, they do not know who the people that they are planning for are. Yes, the figures that INEC will uh, eventually transmit when uh, 2023 comes, you know, is one set of figures in terms of people who voted for them. But let's not forget that it's not only the people who voted for them that matter 
the people who did not vote at all, the people who cannot vote at all, the people who are yet to be old enough to vote at all, all of them matter and politicians need to provide for them. So how can you provide for, for people that you don't even know their numbers? So it is important that we do a census. It's a shame that we've left it this late, you know, to the point where it could be subjected to controversy. But at least let us have something that we can work with. Let us have an update from is it the 2006 uh, census. I remember the 2006 census because I was serving and I was wondering if I was going to get counted uh, where I was serving. You know, somehow I didn't get counted where I was, but I understand that my family, you know, when they went to the house, at least they said that they had four children. So maybe, maybe I was included somewhere there. But I hope that this will be open and transparent in such a way that the figures will not be uh, maybe some of them might be controversial, but at least let it be something that is evidence-based, something that we all can work with, uh, even as our numbers continue to grow. Gentlemen. I must thank Mark Bear, really, for using the party analogy, party, party planning. I think it just hits home, really. So, Mark Bear, thank you so much. It's clearer now, you know, thinking if you want to plan for a party, you need to know how many people are coming. So, <laughs> amazing one there. I think it's on that score of the party that we're going to start this morning, only not the social one, maybe the political one. And let's take a look at the front page of the leadership newspaper first today, and it is talking about 19 days to convention. APC won't collapse on my watch. That's according to PMB. The story is on page four. It says party will survive post-convention crisis. We are not opposing Buhari on consensus. Subscribe to Al Makura. President won't subscribe to imposition. Ascribe to Senator Musa. Find the details on page four of the paper this morning. President off to London says Nigeria in safe hands. Question, whose hands? Maybe the story, the details you find on page eight of the paper this morning. Well, I think it's a bit, I mean, straightforward, but hey, more details in the inside pages. If it was that straightforward, we would never have come to the doctrine of necessity. You know, so just, just, just to put that out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's leave that for the uh, leadership news. So many other issues on the front page, but that's the leadership newspaper this morning. All right. Uh, take a look at Nigerian Tribune next. Uh, that's what we have for you. And still focuses on the All Progressives Congress. That's the Nigerian Tribune's front page. You see APC convention, crack in caretaker committee, plot over neck committee. No governor has power to convene a meeting. Uh, that's coming from Nabena. You see chairman aspirants or chairmanship aspirants uh, adamant intensify campaigns despite Adamo's endorsement. More writers, Buhari didn't endorse me, ex Nasarawa governor. You see Musa rails out program. So it's a lot happening uh, for the APC. Today is what the seventh, they have about 19 days. Uh, to ensure that that date, 26th of March, uh, that target is met because we've had shifts and shifts. So this has to go down if the party wants to show at least seriousness to Nigerians. On top know, of the nameplate. Well, my, my apologies, yeah. uh, Claudia. I, I don't know why this happens to major parties, uh, major political parties. When it was when PDP was uh, in the eye of the storm, storm, so to speak, it was in the eye of the storm. Mm. So, um, is it because of size, success? What is it that, that causes these things? Or happen? interests, or I mean, you you can't rule out these things when you have a party in power. It means that you have what what do you call them now? The the, the VIPs, so the VVIPs, as it were. So it's understandable that this is happening. But I mean, the big picture is 2023 elections and the time. Don't forget, INEC has given a time frame, or at least the Electoral Act. Has mm. given a time frame. They need to meet these deadlines <laughs> if they want to participate in the election. Well, on top of the nameplate, you see that story from NDLA. NDLA to Arane Carey, six others today. So it's a very big day, really, uh, across board, actually. And uh, there's also this one. You can see the picture there. Our 113th posthumous birthday. African leaders, Nigerian governors, monarchs, scholars relieve. Abu's legacies. You can see a lot of writers. He saved the country from debt during the civil war. Go on. Time to dump unhelpful European values, Sultan. And, you know, the writers go on and on. And it's just amazing how, you know, a lot of people say 
great things about him. I mean, if you watch uh, our sister program, Politics Today, uh, one of the guests, uh, lawmaker, former lawmaker, De Haye, was talking about how he left his job in the civil service to go into the party because he just wanted to, he appreciated the values and uh, I know that uh, Baba Wola was stood for. Page two has more details on the Nigerian Tribune this morning. Let's leave it there for the paper. Well, let's take a look at the Abuja Inquirer this morning. Yes, I'll be telling you what's happening in the FCT. And look at it. Abuja residents groan as heat wave, fuel scarcity persists. Heat stroke, meningitis, fears heighten. This is hell. That's according to residents. And if you think they're exaggerating, you can come to the FCT and feel it for yourself. It is hot. I mean, I think on Saturday it was as hot as 38 degrees. It was quite hot. I mean, I had to go and check whether the air conditionings are working. And it's when you go out, you realize that, okay, the outside is actually a lot hotter than, you know, inside. And you realize, okay, they're working. But what's going on? It is very hot in Abuja. Uh, page three will give you details. For those who are not able to use air conditioning, I think there are people who are now giving tips on how to survive the heat without air conditioning. One of it is reduce the intake of salt. But look at this. Abuja residents grow as heat wave fuel scarcity persists. Uh, this is also on top of the nameplates. Controversy Trails New Police Dress Code is on page three of the paper. Uh, native doctor Hang Self in Benue. It's on page 12. You might want to read it. 2022 UTME over 500,000 candidates register as jam targets 1.5 million. It's a page 10 read. IWD, that's International Women's Day, which will be tomorrow. As Nigerian women, we have talked enough. That's uh, attributed to Brown. You might want to see details uh, on page 13. Let's leave it there for the paper. The Guardian newspaper is uh, talking about something that's been in the news for a little while, and it's the national carrier. New national carrier may take off quarter two as bid opens this week. And there is a rider to it. No request for AOC ATL yet. NTAA insists. Um, that's the thing about the aviation sector. I see some of these, you know, what do I call them acronyms now? You wonder which. <laughs> but you know, more details. I, I know what NCA is. Uh, well, the, um, the, it's just, I mean, if you, you want to begin work quarter two, you don't have the air operator certificate, you don't have the air transport license, and those are the two issues. And the NCA, uh, the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority. Okay, you know that one. Okay. <laughs> Just, just so we're clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, this conversation is actually quite important. It's, a, it's an issue of safety. Mm -hmm. uh, when you go to the airport to board an airplane, you are looking at luxury. You are looking at comfort. But the industry is looking at safety and security. And, 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 and it's a, I mean, on the other side, it's a business as well. Oh, yes, it is a business. So how real these things are, I guess we, come, we get to see in coming days. So many other stories on the front page of the paper this morning. PDP APC trade tackles of a, quote, more destructive party, unquote, to Nigerians. Find the details on page three. That's the Guardian newspaper this morning. Quite interesting, uh, <laughs> that one. Uh, but let's turn our attention to uh, well, speaking of party politics, let's see the Daily Times. And just to touch on this one, because the president has spoken about it, you see National Convention, APC will surprise critics, uh, Buhari, and um, says Oshimbajo to be in charge while he's away to London for medical checkup. A um, couple of other stories. Competence shall determine who becomes Nigeria's next president. Catholic bishops urges Nigerians to resist temptation of uh, falling into divisive political campaign ahead of 2023 polls. That's the Daily Times. Okay. Let's look at the Daily Trust for you. Food crisis looms as fertilizer prices soar ahead of rainy season. I think I'm the one putting all of those um, conjunctions there. Food crisis looms as fertilizer price soars ahead rainy season. That's what you find on the front page. Russia-Ukraine conflict may worsen situation. Experts propose way forward. Uh, that's 
uh, the lead story is something that the minister, the new minister of agriculture needs to take a look at uh, if this is something that they can intervene in. If fertilizer is going to be the cause of food prices becoming high, I'm sure we can remedy the situation. Uncertainty over Nigeria air three weeks to take off. I don't want to say anything on that. <laughs> I reserve my comments on it. Hobby, wife, five-month-old child kidnapped in Abuja. That's also on the front page. Uh, Niger IDPs seek refuge at hydropower station facilities. Yes, indeed. Remember that there was a community, of, a host of communities which were bombed, allegedly, by Boko Haram around the Shiroro area of um, of uh, Niger State and Shiro is where we have a dam which is supposed to provide electricity to many parts of the country and uh, that community was bombed so they also have an update on that Niger IDP seek refuge at hydropower station facilities well let's leave it there for the daily trust you have a different picture from the one I have but hey sometimes it happens let's leave it there for the daily trust the front page of the Nigerian News Direct seems to uh, agree with you this morning, Mark, we're on fuel price. That's it. Fuel scarcity. Motorists dump 200 naira per litre filling stations amidst uncertainty over deregulation. Um, your truly experience wasn't that because, the f first of all, I want to get a fuel. Now you can decide whether or not you want to, you know, consider prices later on. But look at the, the rider as long queues reduce in Lagos Southwest. Find the story on page three of the paper this morning. Um, again, uh, over the weekend it was also that I saw that report asking, is it, is it that that story is just dying? We're not going to talk about it anymore. Uh, how it, what happened? why it happened how do we forestall because the bad fuel that the bad fuel story and all but that's the the lead of the paper this morning amongst several others in, 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 in any case pardon me we're still expecting that uh i mean and i know that the nmpc gmd apologized to nigerians mm -hmm. but we're still expecting the outcome of the investigation that the minister of state for petroleum resources said they had started the national assembly also is investigating this so if anything we're expecting the outcome of investigations from both Legislature and executive investigations. Well, okay, exactly. Well. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Right above the nameplate, among several other stories, FG will 5G will revolutionize Nigeria's creative industry. Stories on page two, ascribed to Dambata. Find the details on the inside pages this morning. Well, the next is Vanguard. Uh, Vanguard has this one on uh, VAT, saying that leaving VAT on concurrent lists worrisome. OPS says FG states businesses, consumers will bear brunt. Businesses will have to pay VAT in each state. You see more state laws on VAT coming. So that, that conversation has not gone anywhere. I mean, the case is still before the Supreme Court. Might that be why the, the National Assembly uh, couldn't vote to get it on the exclusive legislative list? Well. Who knows page five has more details but you know the constitution is not quite clear actually on it which is what you know the governor of river state now the governor of lagos state are challenging in court so that one clearly will be a big one in the coming days i see investors pull back from mutual funds asset value down 12.2 percent to 1.12 trillion naira in 2021 and you see dealers blame low returns and knowledge gap you have the APC story as well as Mr. and Mrs. But, you know, I'll leave you to do Mr. and Mrs. this morning. That's the Vanga news. <coughs> 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 well, is it going to be taken or not? Well, I can't hear anything, so I'm just going to assume that you're done with the Vanguard. Let's take a look at New Telegraph this morning, and it has this. APC convention will shock critics, says Buhari, as zoning committee submits report today amidst rumors that national convention date may be shifted again. Sources say forms will be sold to designated candidates as subcommittees are inaugurated today. APC chair, alibi by president's consensus arrangement. 
that's uh, according to Sani Musa. And then you also see uh, at the bottom there some warning. Persistent queues at filling stations. Stop storing fuel at home. That's according to Fire Chief. As Lagos records 249 fire cases between January and February, urges stations attendants to stop sale of PMS in polythene bags. Is there anything you wouldn't see in Lagos? I mean, you Lagosians, come on. <laughs> you Lagosians, my friend. Ayo, we Lagosians. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not just. I'm well, not even going to respond. Ones of dangers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to deny my Lagos citizenship. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. But come on. <laughs> ones of dangers of using same jerry cans, alternatively for PMS, kerosene, and other flammable liquids. ROI youths urge Nigerians to join in fuel rescue efforts. So you find all of the details on pages three and seven. But speaking more seriously, there's this talk of even storing it in jerry cans and this uh, plastic jerry cans are quite dangerous and if you can get this metal cans it might be a better form of storage uh, for petrol usually sometimes they refuse to sell petrol to anyone holding a jerry can people have now started removing their petrol tanks of the of their generators to bring it to the filling station but you know we have to find a way to address the fact that people use alternative sources of power and they need fuel to power this thing so how do we get it there's a big question if we're really are uh, you know big on the safety issues the safety concerns which are very valid concerns by the way uh, that's let's leave it there for new telegraph and with that we wrap up a look at the papers this morning we're back to take on our first issue we're not abandoning our own we'll be right back A second batch of 183 evacuees from Poland arrive at the Inamdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, at about 6.30 p.m. At hand to receive them is a joint government team led by the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Mrs. Sadia Farouk. The evacuees are mostly students. Behind me, the second set of Nigerians that have been evacuated from Ukraine. Many of them have longed to return to their fatherland after Russia attacked Ukraine, devastating the economy of the country and setting many people on the edge. They are taken through some COVID-19 protocols, including testing for the virus, while also undergoing documentation procedures. Our government has been very, very proactive. Uh, Mr. President has done all the needful, and he directed that all Nigerians living in these countries should be brought back home in safety and in dignity, and that is what we have done. The war in Ukraine has claimed hundreds of lives, with about one million people reportedly displaced amidst rising humanitarian crises. These young Nigerian evacuees narrate their experiences of the conflict. There was panic up and down. The stores were all cleared out. Uh, yeah, we're just all worried and hearing the sirens and everything. It was so devastating because in my life I've never seen people dying. We were traumatized because we are not ready. We are not mentally ready for this. But they are glad the Nigerian government came through for them. People came through for us. Nigeria government came through for us. They kept checking on us. So it gave us hope that we could still survive it and we did. 
Out of the 183 evacuees from Poland, 180 are adults and three infants. The government says at least 60 more Nigerians may have been left behind in Poland as it expresses worries over more than 300 Nigerians still trapped in a part of Ukraine considered unsafe. There are still a lot of Nigerians that have not even decided to leave Ukraine. You know, that's one. Two, we still have uh, over 350 students in SUNY College, which has been cut off. You know, they can't go to Russia. They can't come in. You know, their light was being restored now. At the time, it was cut off. Water was cut off. So as soon as we were, we are true with the safe corridor, we will be able to go for those ones too. And as the evacuees from Poland are cleared, another batch of 174 evacuees, including children, arrives at about 11.25 p.m., this time from Hungary. Physically exhausted, mentally distressed, some try to avoid the camera. They are also taken through the protocols in place and are documented. They too have a story to tell. I got injured. I sustained a lot of injuries. My leg, I had to, I was limping for like three, four days. And like, we, we, didn't, we didn't get a shower for like about four or five days. Sometimes we don't even remember if we've eaten that day, if we've drunk water or anything. Outside the hall, their families wait desperately to receive them. And the joy of those whose words have arrived knows no bound. Oh, I don't know what I will say. I thank God. I just thank God. Yeah. How do you feel meeting mommy? I feel good, great, happy, thankful that I am safe to meet her. Foremost, I felt happy because I now know, yes, the, the, the situation is not as I expected it to be in the first place because my government, which is Nigerian government, has done all the needful that is required of any government. More than 5,000 Nigerians, mostly students, were cut up in the Ukrainian crisis, many of whom have fled to neighboring countries. The Nigerian government plans to evacuate those willing to return in a matter of days, a commitment projected to gap the sum of $8.5 million. It's a feeling of joy on one side that they are back home away from the devastating effect of the war in Ukraine. But on the other hand, they're not happy because their studies somehow has been interrupted. They are hoping that the war in Ukraine will end very soon and they will go back to their school and fulfill their dreams. Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. It's a mixed bag, really. I mean, it's heartwarming to see that exactly 1,079 Nigerians, most of them students, have been evacuated from, well, Romania, Hungary, Poland, as a result of the war in Ukraine. There are about 350 other Nigerians in a place called Sumy, which is a city close to the border with Russia, the Ukrainian border with Russia. And um, over the past few days, we have seen heart-wrenching videos uh, from them about their situation, how uh, they've not been able to leave, how they're running low on supply. In fact, some of them have to melt ice just to get water. And I'm talking some days ago. So there are questions as to uh, what is being done to get them out. Yes, the Nigerian government has earmarked $8.5 million to evacuate Nigerians. So far, we've seen over 1,000, but still Nigerians who want to come home but they are not able to and we're making a case uh, for these people this morning and we're joined on the program by one of them his name is Daniel uh, Boru Ejimade who is a medical student at the Sumi State University in Ukraine he joins us via Zoom uh, this morning uh, Daniel uh, it's good to have you on the program let me just begin by asking how you're faring this morning personally <clears throat> this morning it's um it's just a roller coaster of emotions because, um, like you know, for the past few days, there has been no electricity. 
they've been no water. So the electricity and the water, they just came back on like yesterday or so. In my hostel, they came back like two days ago. But right now, even as the electricity is back, my hostel, we don't have water. So most hostels, they didn't have water and electricity. So they just got water and electricity back. So like someone said, like you've, you've even lost track of how many times you've baited. Sometimes you even forget about eating, like you forget about food, basically. Supplies are running low in the supermarkets. Even to even withdraw cash, it's very hard because the ATMs are not even dispensing. So at this point, it's, you know, the, there was no panic at first because we all thought, okay, yeah, we still had the light, electricity, food supplies. So we're still like, you know, everybody was still feeling okay. But the moment the lights went out, including me, I began to panic a little bit because that's when we realized that, like, this is getting real. So some people even tried heading out, but they were sent back. Some headed out successfully. So right now it's just like a roller coaster of emotions. Like, I don't know, it's, you know, it's conflicting emotions. You are angry because you're like, what's happening? Why are you keeping me here? At the same time, you're scared of heading out because you don't know what you will meet in the, on the road. And you're also scared of your supplies running out. So it's just a roller coaster of emotions, honestly. Well, uh, well if you don't mind me asking, I mean, I, 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 I can only imagine. I can't, you know, pretend to even yeah. understand what you're, you're talking about. But this situation power outage and all is this something that ever happens or this is the first time ever this is the first time since i came to ukraine back in 2018 that we had power outage okay. so like since i've been in ukraine there has never been power outage in my hostel i can't remember when so it was should i say it was new to us so power outage what water issues too, the same thing. So everything just went out all at once and it was like the whole city. Well, so it's uh, scary. was there any, any preparation? I mean, I, I, as I said, it's an emergency situation, so no one really yeah. wanted it to happen, but was there any kind of preparation by the school, any forethought or, or foresight as to this might happen, these are the contingencies that as an institution we should prepare for our students? Well, um, I would say the only contingency or the only plan the school had was when, um, so let me say, when like the attacks are getting close per se, like when the attacks are getting serious, each hostel has a bunker. So we head to the bunkers. So right now, once like they sound the alarm for an artillery airstrike, for example, like they just sound the alarm randomly and they'll tell us we should head to the bunkers. So I think that's like the only so say, contingency, um, contingency plan the school had, just the bunkers. So, and, you know, the thing is, students were telling, were actually telling the school that we are not, we are foreigners here, so we don't know how long this war will persist. And we don't want the situation whereby we'll be stranded here and the war has, you know, gone overboard. So, but the school kept on telling us, like, don't worry, it won't go overboard, everything is fine, this and that, that and this. But now, if you look at the situation, every single city, neighboring city around us, they've all been evacuated. Sumi City, Sumi State University students were stranded here. Like it's it's terrifying because you're talking to your friend who is in another city and he's telling you that he's already in another country at the moment. They're all praying for you. Like at the moment, the only thing that can help us here is just prayers and maybe funds because even the funds, the funds were even asking like like students are even like you know asking their parents for a fund to leave this place. So I would say the only contingency plan the school had, personally that I know of, was the bunkers which they told us that whenever we hear the alarms or the sirens, we head to the bunkers. That's the only contingency. And also they provided some food stuff, like they were able to give us food stuff. But the question is, how long will this war persist? So if you keep on giving us food stuff, like if it continues for a month, two months, three months, would you be feeding us? At the point, you, the Ukrainians, you run out of supplies also, and you also have your people to feed. Oh, clearly so, a very dicey situation, Daniel. Uh, yeah. So. Videos surfaced and we showed some of them, you students yeah. protesting. So who was this targeted at? Was it the school authorities, the government in Sumi? Why is it difficult for you to leave? Who is holding you back, as it were? Okay, um, personally, I think the video was just targeted to like, I think I was personally, me, because I was actually in the video. I was like present in one of the, in the videos that day. I was at the back. So that, that video was actually directed to both the government, both the school, like anybody like it could reach out to. It was just a video that we're making, like let it reach out to people because 
at this point, we don't know where the help can help, where the help will come from. So we're just reaching out to every single person, be it the Ukrainian government, be it the school authorities, be it the Nigerian government, be it even the EU or the UN, we don't know. So like it was targeted to like vast bodies. Let's just like let's just get out of here. And also, um the thing is people have tried leaving the city and I kid you not, I have a group mate of mine, a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine. She left the city yesterday and she went out successfully. Some students left, they went out successfully. Some students left, but they told them to come back. So the school now is saying like we should not head out, it's dangerous and all. Yeah, we know it's risky, but at the same time, students are leaving and they're not facing difficulties. Why? Because they are foreigners. Uh, so Daniel, no. quickly, <laughs> pardon me, who told them to come back? Now, most of them that came back, there were two different stories. Some said they met like the Russian, Russian troops who told them to come back. Another, some other said they said it was the Ukrainian soldiers that told them to head back. So. Me personally, I haven't like made the trip out, but some of my friends, from my friends that I had, some said it was Russian troops that told them to head back. Some say it was the Ukrainian army, like Ukrainian troops that told them to head back. So at this point, it's, should I say it's the two parties, like it's the two countries. Daniel, uh, just before I flip this to my colleague in, in Abuja, mm -hmm. last I heard from, from one of the students there, you were meant to be evacuated by 9 a.m. today. I hear there's been some sort of yes. green light. Uh, are you aware of that? Does that look like that will still happen? How many hours away are you from 9 a.m. right now? Um, personally, I'm 16 minutes away, sorry, um, 18 minutes, sorry, 18 minutes away from 9 a.m. right now in Ukraine. And at the moment, it's not happening. So we were told we were told that like there was a safe green corridor by 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. That's what we were told. So everybody was told to pack up and prepare. I myself, I was ready. Then early hours of this morning, we were told that they didn't reach an agreement with the Russian troops or like the Russian military. They didn't like um, they didn't agree to honor the ceasefire. So the evacuation has been cancelled. <clears throat> At the moment, it's cancelled. So. Right now, it's just everybody trying to find their way out of here. The evacuation has been cancelled. From what I've seen so far, from the information received this morning, the evacuation has been cancelled. It's not happening. And we don't know when next such like opportunity will come up again. So yeah, it has been cancelled. <clears throat> Well, we're going to ask you, we're going to encourage you to keep hope alive. And I know that that's difficult to do when you continue to see that it will seem that uh, help is not coming as quickly as you had thought it was going to come. Uh, but you must also realize that it's a war and that, you know, things are, and can easily change at any point in time. So some students got out safely, uh, they dared it, and they got out safely. Some other students might not be so lucky because of the changing circumstances of the situation. So as much as possible, please stay where the authorities, the school authorities say you should stay. Uh, at least now there, there is an awareness uh, the Nigerian authorities are aware that students are stranded in Sumi and they are still trying to make that arrangement to see how they can arrange a safe corridor. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, how, what is the source of information? Are they keeping constantly in touch with you? Well, yeah, the school actually created an international group so for every single person in the school. So it's a telegram group. So we're all there, so they keep us updated both on like the evacuation plans and also maybe like if there's going to be an airstrike or something. So on the Telegram group, we've been updated like daily on their plans and their movements and everything that would occur in the coming, like everything that they're planning on in the coming days. So yeah, we've been updated by the school. Of, as of recent, we've been updated by the school. Yeah. What about the what about the authorities? That's Nigerian government authorities. Are, are they able to reach you directly? Okay, Not yeah, just you. Um, I mean, yeah. you and of yeah, course yeah. a host of other students who are stranded in Sumi. Um, yeah, I think they are because um, there are some groups I'm on. So I think some people in those groups, they're in other groups that maybe they have like one or two um, Nigerian authorities in those groups. So, so they, they bring information to us too. So I think, yeah, they are reaching out to us like via other students who are in other groups too. Other like maybe WhatsApp group, Telegram groups or something. Yeah. They are keeping us updated. So Nigerian have you people been able to form... 
Have you been able to form a group in such a way, I mean, a connected group in such a way that if, for instance, there is news that there is an evacuation, they finally be able to secure that safe corridor. All of you can leave almost at the same time without anyone being yes. left behind. Yes, yes. The school already made a general, like every single foreign student in Sumi State University, I think we're all in that particular group. Then aside from us being in that particular group, there are other groups that... So let's say, for example, now I get the information from that Sumi State University group. I can now share it in the other groups I'm in. So just in case students who are not in that Sumi State University group, they see this message on time. So I'm personally, I'm on like four or five telegram groups. And those four or five telegram groups, at the same time, the informa like any information drops, someone in those groups sends them to the same, to like to other groups to immediately. So I can see like the same message from maybe the first group I'm in in the other four groups at the same time. So at this point, everybody is like, like they are updating everybody back to back. So if you're not in one group, you must be in the second group, definitely. If you're not in the second group, you must have a friend who is in the second group who will keep you updated. So yeah, we're all in telegram groups regarding the evacuation. Okay, so tell us about, you know, the current situation of things. And I know that anxiety will be one of the things that you might have, I mean, especially when the sirens go off and when you have to go into the bunkers. But generally, uh, 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 would you say that your fellow Nigerians there, are they calm or they are so anxious? Are you able to sleep, for instance? Personally, uh, um, okay, personally speaking for myself, I'm actually like the calm type. So like, even if I'm under this situation, like my dad, I even spoke to my dad, so he like calmed me down and all. But if I'm speaking for, that's me speaking for myself. But if I'm speaking for the Nigerian students here, they're not calm. Like, I can feel the tension, they're all anxious. And I won't blame them. Because um, personally, I have an instance. Was it not, um, I think two days, ago, two days ago or three days ago, there were five bomb shellings before 10 a.m. in my city here. And one of them, I personally heard it. So that kind of thing, it has raised, it has like increased the anxiety in the students here. So it's even hard to even calm them down. I won't blame them. Because with each day passing, like we hear the news of the ceasefire and all, but still, we're still waking up to bomb shellings. So it's getting scary for them and also, personally speaking for the Nigerian students here, everyone is like, everybody is anxious. We just want to just, leave like everybody just wants to just get out of here as quick as possible because it's getting scary every day because you don't know okay today now you're waking up with bomb shellings tomorrow what if god forbid it's your building that gets that gets hit so it's getting scary so day by day we don't even know what to expect so there's anxiety there's fear there's even should i even say anger because like you know you know that moment when you've tried everything and it just seems like nothing is working so you're just angry like what's happening like as per what's happening so yeah, so I would say anxiety, fear, and anxiety, fear, everything is just, I would say that's like the mood at the moment now. And it's totally understandable, Daniel, totally understandable. We will just urge, you know, to know, to let you know that you are in our prayers, you and your fellow Nigerian students are in our prayers, and we'll continue to do all that we can to get your message out there until you are safely out. Uh, but in the meantime, what are comforts, what are creature comforts like? Are you able to, what's the food supply like? I know that you had expressed earlier fears that, you know, even the authorities could soon run mm. out. But in the meantime, if you were to look at what you currently have and may, maybe perhaps access to be able to get more, how much longer would you say that the food supply you have uh, can, can last you for? Uh, personally, the food supply I have, I would say if I'm going to like, try and minimize or minimize what I have, it should take me for maybe two weeks max or three weeks. Because even to head out to the stores, like due to the power outage, like I said earlier, due to the power outage, some stores didn't open up. And some stores are completely shut. So like the stores are being shut and you don't even know where to get your next food from. So from but why uh, why am I able to have some food supply that can last me for like maybe the next two or three weeks is because like I when it started I went and I did like I did a mass you know buying of groceries so that's why I was being able to you know secure something and the things I have even for them to last me for those two three weeks I have to really mice like reduce the way I eat you know watch the way I eat I have to like proportion it. So sometimes, like, there was a day I went throughout that day without even eating food. All I was just eating was just biscuit and drinking water. 
like at the point you will even feel like the hunger may not even be there again. So that's another reason why the food may even last because the hunger you may never feel the hunger again. So personally, for me, I would say like my own food stuff maybe two weeks or three weeks max. Even the three weeks is still under probability, under probability. And I feel and I know I not even I feel I know there are people out here who may even have less. So. Well, I believe that a sense of community will certainly prevail in that respect. But how is it? I know it's still winter in uh, Ukraine right now. So how are you coping with the temperatures? I, I can see that there's electricity where you are. Is the heating yeah. still okay? Yeah, the heating system is working. Yeah, the heating system is working. Well, you know, some of us in the hostels, we have to buy our own personal heaters. So even with the heating system, we still have to buy our own personal heaters. Because in Ukraine here, like, the cold is really... It's really severe. Like sometimes it can get to minus 25 degrees Celsius. So, and it's winter time and there's snow everywhere. Like literally it's white everywhere because snow is everywhere and all. So it's even like, it's very cold. So the, yeah, the heating system is working quite well. Yeah. But also we also need like personal heaters in our room just to just make us very warm because we're not used to such cold. Minus 25 degrees Celsius, it's very cold. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, the well, Daniel, we're going to well. ask you to. Hmm? We're going to ask you to just hold on. You know, um, keep hope alive. Don't don't cut off the line yet. We're going to be speaking hmm. right away to Honourable Yusuf Buba, who is the Chairman Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Representatives. Uh, a number of them, a number of the people in that committee, have been able to come to. Uh, I think it went to Poland to be able to evacuate. Nigerian students who have been able to make it across the border. Good morning, Honourable, and I'd like to find out from you um, if there will be if your if your team is still going to be going back with further ni with men with Nigerian officials to see how they can evacuate even many more Nigerians who might be stranded in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Uh, you know the uh, work of uh, the National Assembly is to oversight the activities of the executive. We are in Romania, and uh, from what we have seen, we are very much satisfied with what the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other relevant agencies are doing, more especially our embassies. Uh, so, so far, the coordination is good, and uh, everything is working according to plan. And uh, that was why uh, when we came back with the first Batch, you can see that uh, other batches have been coming in successfully. So, so far we are in touch with the ministry and uh, we have not seen any hitches to warrant our going out immediately. Again, we are monitoring. Okay, so I, I'm sure you must have been listening to the conversation we have been holding with Daniel, who is uh, stranded alongside other students in Sumi in Ukraine. Uh, do you have any word, any update on how we intend to get out our students who are stranded in Sumi out of that place? Yes, I want to assure uh, the students in Sumi, uh, their parents and Nigerians that uh, the Nigerian government is really on top of the matter. Uh, all the uh, Nigerian government is trying to assure is their safety. Uh, that was why, as of yesterday, because on a daily basis, I communicate with the ministry, with the permanent secretary, and uh, what they want to achieve is to have a tripartite agreement between the Russian uh, government, the Ukrainian government and also the United Nations. So that talk is ongoing so that by the time this evacuation will start, uh, the students will be safe. It's not good to take chances because uh, we are in a war situation. But uh, our government is talking with uh, uh, these three different groups, that is the Ukrainian government, the Russia and the United Nations. And uh, I want to assure these students that uh, they should be calm. I know it's difficult uh, to be calm, even for adults in a situation like this, but that uh, they should be rest assured that the government is not sleeping. I monitor the ministry on hourly basis, and they are not sleeping. They are working on the Sumi issue 
and uh, I'm sure soonest uh, this agreement will be reached and uh, the students will be evacuated to safety, just like uh, it's happening in other parts of Ukraine. Right, uh, Honorable, maybe by way of information to Daniel and the over 300 Nigerians still in Sumi. So the word was they were meant to be evacuated this morning by 9 a.m. And it's almost 9 already. Daniel says it has been cancelled. And I imagine the apprehension, uh, the confusion, especially when you're not hearing a reason as to why uh, the evacuation, the planned evacuation was cancelled. So by way of an update, so they understand what's happening, do you have an idea why that evacuation was cancelled? Well, I don't want to say evacuation is cancelled yet because it's still within uh, the time. Uh, though I have not uh, made any contact this morning, but as of yesterday night, the plan is that uh, the evacuation uh, will take place uh, this morning around nine. But as, as, as we said, we are not in a normal situation. Uh, so uh, a delay uh, in, within some hours uh, will not be too abnormal. But uh, after this interview, I will uh, make contact uh, with the Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs and uh, get updated with what is really happening. But as of, up to yesterday night, uh, the arrangements were in top gear. And I pray and I hope that it is not cancelled, that something will be cancelled. Well, even, even at, as at that, uh, we understand the foreign, minister, foreign Affairs Minister, uh, in a message he put out on Twitter, had raised a challenge of procuring uh, vehicles to move the students. Could that be part of the reason for the delay? Well, I will not know what is the reason for the delay since I have not spoken with, uh, with the Ministry this morning. But as of yesterday, uh, what they were trying to achieve was to get a tripartite arrangement, and I think that was achieved as of yesterday. But uh, for this morning, I won't know uh, why there is a slight delay. But uh, I hope if it is just for vehicles, uh, that will be definitely overcome. The Ministry are working, and uh, I am confident that uh, this evacuation will take place and all our students will be evacuated to safety uh, by the grace of God. Just to be clear, Honorable, uh, tripartite arrange this tripartite arrangement you talked about is between who and who? Between the Ukrainian government, the uh, United Nations and the Russian government. So that, uh, uh, like the young man said, some of the students have tried to go out on their own we are asked to go back either by the Russian government or by the Ukrainian government. He was not sure. So the, the whole place is under control of uh, either the Ukrainians or the Russians. And uh, uh, the United Nations is also uh, talking to both parties uh, to see that this safe corridor is made available so that all civilians that want to move out uh, move out safely without any accidents. So that is, the, uh, that is why it is very important uh, in the situations like this to remain calm and keep uh, talking with the coordinating uh, authorities before making any moves. Uh, and I am sure that uh, uh, these uh, students will be safe. And uh, since uh, their, their situation is fully being taken care of by uh, both the Ukrainian authorities, the school authorities, and also the Nigerian government, specifically the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I am sure uh, with a little patience, uh, we will come over it very soon. Well, Honorable, it's uh, just, uh, I mean, almost 8 a.m. here in Nigeria, meaning that it's about 9 a.m. there in Sumi. But it's quite reassuring to hear you say that that evacuation plan is still on, even though a bit delayed but we're due for a break now but when we return we'd like to hear just how you know dicey the situation is getting that tripartite agreement getting you know the governments on board and talking about the government of ukraine russia and the un i mean don't forget there's been a lot of controversy around that so perhaps also by way of information to understand what's going on we'd like to get some insights into that as well as other issues in a moment so please stay with us
closing moment with Honorable Yusuf Boba, who is a chairman of Foreign Affairs Committee at the House of Representatives, and uh, Daniel Boro Ejimade, who is a medical student in Sumi State University, Ukraine. So, Honorable, just before we went on that break, uh, I was trying to get a sense of how dicey this is, because I know there was the agreement, or there was said to be that agreement during the peace talks, to have a safe corridor for evacuation and supplies and all that. But then, both countries are accusing each other of breaking that agreement, as it were, Russia saying, well, it was Ukraine that broke it, Ukraine saying it was you that fired and all of that. So how tricky is getting the students out, the Nigerians who are stuck in Sumi right now? That is why for every responsible government uh, must be sure that uh, there is a concrete arrangement between the three parties, the Ukrainian government, the Russians, and then bringing in the United Nations to be sure that uh, there is a deal before moving uh, these students because we don't want to uh, take chances uh, with the lives of our students. So the best bet now is to uh, try to calm down the students while uh, governments try to secure uh, these uh, agreements uh, between uh, the two parties with the United uh, Nations uh, being part of it. Then. Uh, safety of the students will be guaranteed to be moved. So I'm sure that will be reached because uh, none of these governments want to hurt any civilian deliberately, both the Russian and the Ukrainian governments. None of them want any civilian to be hurt. Uh, so I am sure uh, to avoid any uh, controversies or accidents, uh, that is why uh, our government, uh, under the supervision of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, wants to make sure that uh, the corridor is safe before movement. This will be done, it will be achieved. It's just, uh, it just needs a little more of patience uh, from all parties. But I am very, very sure it will be achieved. And no, no single child will be hurt. Everybody will be evacuated to safety. So the case of Sumi... Uh, uh, the case of Sumi is quite delicate because it's very close to Russia. Uh, but I just want to know quickly, what kind of uh, assurances are you getting from the Ukrainian government and the Russian government in getting those Jehovah. students out? Because it's important to know their state of mind. Okay, I think that was Daniel, but go ahead, Honorable. That's why I'm saying uh, our government has been up and doing. They have not been sleeping. They have been walking around the clock, uh, making contact with uh, all parties. And I, I want to assure you that before they will start moving the students, they, mu they, will, they must be definitely sure that the corridors are safe and uh, the students will be moved to safety. We are close to that, uh, and it will, be, it will be achieved as soon as the best of God. Okay, uh, let, me, let me take this back to Daniel. And um, first, I mean, see how he's internalizing some of the things you have said, uh, Honorable. So, Daniel, uh, you have listened to the Honorable speaking regarding the evacuation plan, saying, well, it's still on, even though it's, what, about six minutes past nine where you are, which was a, mm -hmm. nine was a scheduled time for the evacuation. So, hearing that this evacuation is still on, and then the situation between Russia and Ukraine, yes, there's been a safe corridor, but countries are accusing themselves of breaking that. How are you internalizing that? How does, where does that put you? right now um, the news of the evacuation still being possible uh, it's giving me like a glimpse of hope that okay yeah so that means maybe something can still be done then um, i'm looking at them saying like you know the russian and ukrainian you know um having conflict like saying this one fired first one fired first um it's just funny to me because like everything we've seen so far and what we've experienced so far it's the aggressors who are the ones that I would say are taking action. So if it's regarding them blaming who and who, it's the aggressors. It's the aggressors who are the ones who are like the ones that are, should I say, um, causing the whole commotion and all. Yeah, the aggressors ones who are causing the whole commotion. So I don't know why there's a toss up between who is shooting first and who is not shooting first. From what we've seen here, we know who is attacking first. We know who is you know, who is attacking first and who is the aggressor in this whole situation. So that aside, um, like I said, since they said the evacuation is still, like they're still making plans for it to still happen today, yeah, I'm still having hope. And hopefully, because yeah, like you said, right now it's 9.07 a.m. here. So I'm still having a glimpse of hope that, okay, yeah, 
since they said it's still talks are still going on at the moment and they are still you know looking for a way to make it possible still today i think i'll just cleanse to that little hope i have and let's just see that hopefully it goes through okay hopefully well, it goes through. Just, just before we let you go daniel just wanted to ask you what's your state of mind and if you can also gauge the state of mind of your fellow students you've spoken about the anxiety level and all but in terms of general state of mind how significantly is that affecting the well-being of everyone well regarding the state of mind i'm like oh yeah like i mentioned earlier the anxiety and all at the moment it's i'm not like it's actually making people to even make should i say no should i say rash decisions at this moment because the anxiety level is increasing, the panic level is increasing. So, and that is making students here, you know, begin to make decisions that are like, it's, I won't blame them for decisions personally, because even I, if I had the opportunity, I would make such decisions, you know, everybody's trying to find a way out. So at this point, it's just putting like, your mind is not at rest. Basically, everybody's mind is not at rest here, because you don't know what will happen the next day. Okay, if today finishes now, if today is over, what are you going to see or what will happen tomorrow? So everybody's on their toes at the moment. We don't know what's happening. We don't even know if, God forbid, you don't even know if tomorrow the building you're in will get hit. So at this point, everybody is just making everybody, you know, begin to look for a way out, like panic everywhere. I'm me, I'm just still trying to keep my cool. But personally speaking, I am panicking. Like I'm panicking, but I'm just, you know, composed because at this point in time, you don't need to. Like you don't have, to, you don't need to allow your panic overwhelm you because you can now, you know, you might not be able to think clearly. And at this point in time, you need to think clearly. That's just the major thing. So yeah, the panic level, the anxiety, it's over the roof, and it's making students like you know, just move everywhere. Like it's it's rowdy here, it's rowdy here. So that's just all I can just say regarding like my fellow Nigerian students here. Well, Daniel, if this is any assurance, uh, I'd want you to know that you're not alone in this. We're with you on this. We'll continue to keep you know, the spotlight on your issues and show that we try at least to get all the help that you can get. You've listened to the Nigerian government, so please keep hope alive. We hope to see you in person uh, very soon. But for now, we'll have to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Daniel Boro Jimade is a medical student at Sumi State University, uh, Ukraine, joined us via Zoom this morning. We've also had uh, Honorable Yusuf Bubao, the Chairman Foreign Affairs Committee at the House of Representatives, giving us a side of the authorities on this one as well. And our sincere hope is that all of this ends uh, in joy. Thank you so much for your time. Well, you always hear that there's a kinetic and non-kinetic angle to wars like this, but there's also another aspect, which is the psychological. You heard Daniel saying there that he's distressed. So we'll go to break, but we'll be back with this all-important conversation. So please stay with us. The returnees from Romania have a story to tell one which many young Nigerians may never experience in their lifetime. The experience of a full-blown war and what it means to have a refugee status outside of Nigeria. Wary from their travels and traumatized by the idea that they could have been killed in the war between Russia and Ukraine, these over 400 young Nigerians, mostly students, tell us what it was like to escape the conflict. We were struggling, people were screaming, there was like a lot of tussle to get across the line. I even saw someone climb over people's heads just to get like into the border. It was like really very stressful crossing the Ukrainian side of the border. It was chaotic because everyone was fighting within themselves and nobody wanted to be the last to go. So it was very tight, so everyone was practically pushing. I, they, you know, there was a lot of stampede. I have joint pain, back pain. The sirens were like ringing every day and every day and every day, so that didn't make us feel safe, uh, my um, friends. So um, at a certain point we left, we went to the Syrian border, the border bordering Ukraine and Romania, and from there we were able to like cross, but it was terrible. An overwhelming sentiment among the returnees is the poor treatment they say they experienced from the Nigerian embassy in Kiev, Ukraine. 
we contacted them and we we're like, oh, that, oh, we need like help. Like, what are we doing? What are we going to do? And we're like, students, um, take care of yourself, find a place that is safe. And that was strange to us because we we're expecting that, oh, maybe they will organize like a bus that will take all of us to like a border where we could cross from. But that was not the case. Maybe if the embassy in Kiev like gave like a special letter to all the borders, maybe Nigerians would have been able to pass easily, more like easily. But we weren't really getting like proper responses from them. There's still so many questions about the impact the war in Ukraine has had on people. But for these kids right behind me, they're just glad to be back home. Right now, they're going to be given a stipend by the federal government to ensure that they get to their respective destinations. A lot of COVID tests are going on right now. And they're hoping that these processes are done quickly so they can go back to their families. Kayla Megwa, Channels Television News. Well, you heard my colleague there talk about impact of the conflict on the Nigerians who have returned. Now, we're not only speaking to that this morning, we are also speaking to those whom we spoke with the other time, the impact on them as well. Dr. Olajumoke Koejo joins us this morning. She's a consultant psychiatrist at the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital, Yaba, here in our studio. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Impact. impact. Uh, um, it's only it, it's only imagined. It can only be imagined by those who do not have direct uh, uh, conversation or you know conflict or contact with the situation that these students have had. But can you give us an idea of what they could be going through now? First, speak to those who are who have arrived. What kind of impact has it had on them, or what kind of support we should be giving them? Thank you very much um, for this. Well, war zone, war effects. On these students, is a major life event. And it's something they've not prepared for, and they've never prepared for. And the question is, what's even a major life event? Mm -hmm. Don't let me just gloss over it. Environmental changes, they have some degree of psychological threats, behavioral change on people. They have a specific time of onset, but they don't know the end of it. That's, that's, that's a major life event. And this war actually falls into that. Another thing we should look at is that it's an ongoing assault on this thing, because they'll be watching television. They have some form of attachment to their school. They have some form of, you know, they went there believing that, okay, they're going to have the best of education. Now they are back in Nigeria. There's nothing to do. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's going to be a very great one for them. And all we should be doing now is how to walk them through. How, do you, would you say we have taken the first step well, along that line? Yeah. When are the major life events? What happens? There will be emotional response with somatic accompaniment. Emotional response, like you said, roller coaster of emotions. Sometimes they are sad, sometimes they are happy, sometimes, you know, they have so much anxiety and panic. And that's the first and that's what they're experiencing now. And the first thing is how to solve the problems, how to reduce the emotions on the part of the students. And the first thing is we've removed them from the site of the trauma, partly, because they'll still be watching television. They will still, that's assault, is to continue while they are even in Nigeria. So we, we should walk them through it. We're going to um, reunion, um, you know, unite them back to their loved ones. But the point is, how do we reduce the emotional impact on these students? Because major life events is a, is a risk factor for psychiatric illness. And it's not just about reuniting them. It's not just about them. You're, you're fine now. It's not, it, that's not it. It's a big thing that we have to take seriously, and the Nigerian government and everybody has all hands to be on deck on all of them because they are at a major risk. You know, I, I imagine that there are different grades to major life events. I mean, mm -hmm. Maybe losing a job or I mean, 
get in heartbreak and be a major life event for some people. But this is on another level entirely. I mean, the threat uh, level of this one is perhaps more. I mean, people react to things differently. But you kept saying, we need to walk them through this. We need to give them the support. Whose responsibility is it to do all of that? I, I want to imagine it's going to be a joint responsibility. But how should this happen? Thank you very much. Well, responsible of the government, the parents, and everybody, really. Responsible media reporting. So it's not just about the government. It's about all of us helping the people walk through it. Like I said, they've gone through threats. They've gone through separation. They've gone through loss. Threats of life, they've gone through it. They've separation from their, their schools. And they've gone through loss of, you know, they've lost they would they want to see if even buildings coming down is a great loss today. You can see. So it's 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 not going to be um so they've gone through all forms of the three and so it's going to have very high impact on them. What kind of impact? Psychological, emotional, and there'll be somatic, that means there'll be physical accompaniment because those things manifest in some physical forms, heightened emotions. It would be shocked that some people's blood pressure would go up. They would, they would have tachycardia. They'll be hearing their heart beat. They would, you know, they can't just control it. And our responses are different from each other. And we can't afford to just, once we leave, get, when they get, once they get in and they'll just leave them. That's when the work is just starting. Should, should they be going through, I mean, some of them were evacuated, what, on Friday? Yes. Saturday, Sunday, this is Monday. Um, should they be already going through some form of debriefing, counseling, yes. perhaps psychotherapy? What exactly should we be looking at? Yeah. They should be going through debriefing, critical incident stress uh, debrief, debriefing. Because it's so important that we, we know that they've gone through so much. And we start, we should just, they should just, in fact, the first thing is to do physical care and have a psychiatrist ex assess them. Every single one of them. All of them. Okay, now that some of them, well, some of them will join their parents, will travel home, and all of that. What kind of, uh, what what kind of reception? What should be happening at home? Yeah, it's it's of course we solve the problem. We remove them from from the site of um, of the incidents. The emotion reducing um, ventilation. We should allow them ventilate. We should not force them to. Do. We should do a positive appraisal of the situation of what has happened. Okay. These are the things that happen. And a critical appraisal, the things you can change, you change, the things you can't change, you accept. And dispassionately move through it and, okay, what is the next thing to do? That's one aspect. The other aspect is to attain to their emotional needs. I would say they should be assessed by a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, to, a medical doctor to do a full assessment, both physically and mentally, for these students. You, you, you talked about the behavioral change the other time. Yes. Uh, how easy will it be for parents to understand that, seeing that they are young people, they are, they are young men and young women, and who n have natural you know, patterns of behavior before, and then all of a sudden things change at home. Yeah. What kind of things should parents look out for, and what should they do? Well, some students would have abnormal coping strategies when psychoactive substance use. Some students, be, be very, so it's, it's watching them. Be very change, like even withdrawal to self, isolation, could happen to any of the students. So it's, 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 it's not just about, OK, now you're home. It's about, like I said, assessing them and letting them start all sorts of for professionals to start from form of counseling and therapy, psychotherapy on these students. because. This is a routine I'm used to wake up, go to class, and I'm seeing that, okay, in six months' time, I'll be a graduate. Now, you don't even know when that would, um, um, that's hope of becoming a university graduate is coming. You don't know the end of the war, you don't, of this war, and it's a continuous assault because they will keep watching the television, they will keep getting information about their, their schools, about their loved ones in Ukraine. So it, it's, it's, it's not just about, um, the direct changes could not be numerous. Some people would, you know, of course, some would go into some positive things, exercise and some other things. But watch out for substances in this patient. Watch out for people that have 
predisposing factor, risk of psychiatric illness, they might break down. They might go into depression, sad, guilt, uh, sadness, guilt, low self-esteem, all forms of, all, you know, all sorts of things could happen to them. And those are the family history of psychosis, you know, hallucinations, delusions could happen. Okay. So they really need to be monitored. But we can't say the same for those who are still in Ukraine right now. Wow. <laughs> Eye of the storm. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's about... Um, they, are, they, are, they are still there. The threat is continuous on these students. And the, the type of assault on them is much higher than, than those are in Nigeria. So, of course, you can't start that now. The, what we should all go for is to take them away from that assault force. That's what is necessary for those ones. Of course, we should keep reassuring them, though. But that might not be um, effective yet. But for those that are in Nigeria, they should continue, not just one session of debriefing. Continuous debriefing should go on next six months because you don't know who would have post-traumatic stress disorder. Those have previous history of psychiatric illness, who would break down? So they need so much psychological support at this point in time by experts, not I can do it person. A colleague has a question for you. Well, I'd like to focus a little more on the students who are still in Ukraine. I know that you already mentioned that they're in the eye of the storm, and it, it is true that they are. Um, we spoke with Daniel earlier, who is a medical student there, trying to give us a state of mind of his own uh, fellow students. He says, naturally, he's a calm person, that he, he's trying his best not to panic. I mean, the situation is enough for him to panic, but he's really doing his utmost. For those who are unable to, you know, be as calm as Daniel um, is, what would you recommend to them? What would you say they can do to ensure that they keep calm? Thank you very much. Well, for those that are still in Ukraine, we should keep reassuring them. That's the first thing. And they should do a critical appraisal of the situation. Now, you can't leave that sea. You can't leave the country yet. However, we should look at appraisal of, OK, what is it that I can do? Let me do it. Those things I can change, let me change. And those things I can't change, let me accept it and make the best use of what is happening to me. And this is not the time to go into substance use. This is not the time to, to get positive feedback, to look for those, that, those things that will reassure you. And like the Ghanaian government is doing, trying to reassure everybody is working hard for you. So try to be in the midst of people that would encourage you, because that's, that, that's the way to go. And maybe we can start online some form of reassurance for them online so that it will help them and counseling, it would really help them. At least they have access to their phones now. So it would really be of great help for the students right there so that they can be on top of the situation to a large extent. You know, their own situation is worsened by the fact that they have to wait. Um, there's anything I know a lot of human beings hate it is having to wait and not knowing for how long more you're waiting. I mean, they're waiting to be rescued. Uh, we understand the Nigerian government is trying to ensure that there's a safe corridor to take them through. Um, as we spoke with them this morning, they said that uh, there was supposed to be an evacuation this morning between 9 and 11. From what our respondent said, he said he has not seen signs of that just yet. And I imagine that a lot of students will be on the edge um, that's more immediate in terms of, you know, the, 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 well, I say the anxiety. Will the bus come? Will it not come? Um, how, do you, how do we say that, you know, we manage those expectations? Well, if, giving them information would be reassuring to them of effort everybody is making to get them out of the place. Because that is what they need now giving them the right information that will be reassuring to all of them. Okay, we're working on it, this is what is happening. Not just keeping quiet, we really have to continue to give them the right information so that they will know okay, everybody is working hard to get them out of this situation and let's see what's next to do. Because that, 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 that's, that's, that's what is important for them now. And like I, like I said, critical appraisal of the situation will really be helpful for them too. So we, 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 we can't just leave them there. Information is important for them, reassuring.
information will really be of help at this point in time. Well, we know that a large population of those who are in Ukraine are students, um, I mean, bef even before the war, and a lot of them who have come back are majorly students. While we give uh, parents tips on things to look out for with their words, because oftentimes we know that young people do not, they, they like to tell their parents, I'm fine, look, don't bother about me. But I'm sure that parents will, 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 will be looking out for signs to look out for to know when their child uh, you know, will need cancelling or is not handling uh, this this uh, traumatic experience pretty well. And some of them you have already outlined. But for those who were are parents themselves, so let's not forget that a number of them also uh, were not students. They, they were people working perhaps in, in that area. Some of them have come back with children, uh, little children. What, what particular tips would you be giving to them? Thank you very much. Well, all of them should go for assessment. All of them should go for assessment. Because it, from this assessment, expert would, professionals will knock it. This person, we, we would just need counseling. This person would have to go through full therapy and the rest like that. So it's not about students only. All of them that came back, they've all gone through that major life event. They've, they've, um, they've seen it. So it's not about uh, parents watching out. Of course, parents would watch out, but they also need all of them should go and see professionals and be followed up appropriately. Well, we can only thank you this morning for the perspectives you've given to this issue. Most of the time when we hear of these things, it's just, as my colleague said earlier, kinetic, non-kinetic, who even understands some of these things many times. We have to thank you very much for uh, conversing with us this morning. Dr. Olajumo Kekoejo is a consultant psychiatrist with the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital, Yaba. Thank you so much once thank again. Thank you very much. Well, something else has been giving a number of people some concerns. I hope it's not something that's going to demand Dr. Jumoke's help. We'll take on that after this break. We hope that the information that you will get in this conversation will help you avoid all kinds of psychiatric issues that sometimes come as a result of heavy traffic in Lagos. As you've seen in the welcoming slide, uh, Mr. Uluato Infainka joins us this morning, his special advisor to the Governor of Lagos State on Transport. Thanks for joining us this morning. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, um, Eco bridge repairs and traffic diversions. Uh, there are many who are wondering. Well, this conversation around the repairs of Eco bridge has been on for so long. Uh, is there a reason it's taking so long, or things that people don't understand? Uh, well, I, can you come again? What you see that is taking so long? The repairs on Eco bridge. Oh, thank you very much. The federal ministry of Fox has got so many things to do. And then I think they do it uh, in batches. So the eco bridge was done at the time. But you know, it has been long. This bridge especially was constructed. So there is no for uh, constant maintenance. So the federal minister of Fox had just written us as a government that they will be coming to repair a co bridge. So we don't have control over certain things as a government here in state. So federal government wrote to us whenever they think they need to repair it. So taking long, we want to appeal. To, and that is no green sign of the fact that this bridge needs to be repaired. Mm -hmm. And then so taking long should be outside of the conversation, at least for the better betterment of every one of us. Absolutely. I mean, seeing that this is a bridge 
It's a big one. But, but as you said, it's meant to be handled by the federal government. But Lagos, since it's in Lagos, you have to do the whole traffic diversion and ensure that things go quite well. But just quickly on that point of the repairs as well. What is wrong with Eco Bridge this time around? Uh, do you have an inkling? I know there was some repairs last last year between I think June and August, and uh, some of some work was done. So this time around, is it the suspension joints? What exactly is being done this time around? Thank you very much. Eco Bridge, no matter how short you may look at it, is very long, and then we have series of suspension uh, in between. So they have done some, but what they are doing now is between Alaka and a more out. A co bridge, when you get to a certain place, it, it, it becomes too or three. So, but this time around, Alaka and to a end is what they are focusing on. So, the suspensions, some of them need to be repaired, and that is what they are doing this time around. And then they said, if you take six months, you know, they want to do a kind of repair that will be very, very enduring. So, we cannot blame them. We just have to. Our people, as a, as, a, as a government, that's very, very responsible and responsive. We will not allow that one to inconvenience our people. We are ready to make things very, very seamless for our people. That is our duty. So let's get into that, making it seamless. Just, sorry, yeah, okay, just before ahead. we get into that yeah. one, I remember that one of the issues that uh, I think the governor of Lagos State himself raised concerning uh, the reasons for this is um, vehicles, left on the bridge for long periods, heavy-duty vehicles and all of that. Uh, we know that that is part of the reason, at least according to the governor. What has been done about that one to ensure that even after these repairs, we don't go back to that state again? Thank you very much. Let me quickly say this. The Honorable Commissioner of Transport, Dr. Frederick Ladendi, had made it abundantly clear, according, as one of his prophets, that the bridge, this bridge, Eco Bridge in particular, was going to be closed for six months. That's the first step. After, after that, I'm not taking it as my responsibility to make sure the traffic is seamless. Now back to your question. Mr. Governor of Lagos State is a proactive governor. This bridge, it was not envisaged that the volume of trailers on this road would be so much massive. But well, here we find ourselves, we don't have control absolutely to restrict a particular vehicle from plying any of the roads in Lagos State. But we have made it abundantly clear to anyone that your trailer must not use any of our bridges in Lagos State as a parking lot again. And that is what is bringing a kind of rift between me and some truckers. Well, that's all right. I will ensure no truck is left on any of the bridges in Lagos State because that is the, more, the major reason why these bridges are caving in and we cannot allow that to happen in Lagos State. So there are parks. Lagos State government has infested, to adequately answer your question, has infested much on parks. Several acres of land has been uh, provided by Lagos State government to make it possible for youth truckers to park your vehicles whenever you are not making use of them. So having put all these things in, proper, in, in use, I don't expect you as truckers to not convert our bridges to a parking lot. By the grace of God, I will tow it off. Uh, there, there will always be questions as to how we can enforce that because, I mean, some of these bridges are federal bridges, right? So how can you enforce that? And then they tell you that, you know, it's the tailback from a papa, at least for that access, that causes some of these uh, trucks to be on the road. Some of them don't want to be on the road. But by way of emphasis, where are some of those parks? So some who say they probably don't know, they can I mean, at least explore those options, those parks that have been provided by the Lagos State Government. Thank you very much. As faith worth it, I happen to be the chairman of the a Papa Special Traffic Committee. The governor of Lagos State enabled us, and then they have supported us tremendously. So I would not subscribe to the notion that a particular truckers in Lagos would know, he or she does not know where these parks are. The, but we have populated this conversation very, very massive. So anybody that say he or she doesn't know, well, 
Though advocacy continues, but they are in the know. Where but, these parks are, they are in the know. Mm. This, but some of us would like to cut corners. But we will not allow that to thrive. We won't allow that to try. You, you so, haven't spoken to the part of the conversation where you talked about the, the bridges being federal roads and how Lagos State is going to enforce them. Thank you very much. The federal road enforcement of any sort is that is the duty of that of Lagos State government, as uh, especially as uh, regards the Lagos roads. So federal governments will not, and I'm very sure they have not, and I do know that they will not question us from enforcing traffic clock in Lagos. It is not on an exclusive list for crying out loud. So mm -hmm. any road in Lagos State is free for anybody to use. But you sign not inconveniently because you want to make use of that road. The traffic law, TSL law of 2018 as amended, is very, very explicit. And that is my Bible that I work with. No vehicle is allowed for whatever reason to park or to station or to abandon on the road. So if you have difficulties with your vehicle, there are rules. Put up your sign and then call on the, 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 the towing vehicle to tow it off to your mechanic workshop. Our roads in Lagos are not mechanic workshop and they will not be allowed to convert to be converted as mechanic workshop. You know, this conversation is like a typical road. There are different turnings before you get to the destination. Now, one of those turnings which we didn't quite explore properly Still back to the parks, just for emphasis, can you mention the parks? So it's out there for people perhaps who say they don't know. Thank you very much. So when you are coming to Lagos with your trucks, the MPA in their wisdom have done perfectly okay in this instance. If you are going to a papa, you either go to Tinkan or you're going to a papa ports. We have two ports in Lagos. There are several parks that have been sent to the truckers to make their choices. So if you need to go to a particular destination, before you could get into that place, you need to get a kind of a profile in form of ETO that I'm going, there is template. If 100 trucks are coming to Lagos, we have created an assembly environment that, okay, this particular trucks can only go between 8 a.m. to 12 uh, to 12 noon. Another set of trucks will go between 12 noon to 3 p.m. and so on and so forth. So these time beds have been submitted and escalated to the knowledge of all the truckers in Lagos. So question of I don't know does not arise. No, I'm saying by way of location. So you say one is in Antony, for example, another one no, we is have, in the we have, So we where have, are those parks? We have one at, we have several ones at Ojota. So they are coming. You could, act, you could actually alternate inside this park while you are allowing him to the ports. We have several ones along uh, uh, Amuwu side, approved park at Amuwu. We have some along uh, Ijora, the approved park. There are several, I don't have the list, but we have more than 10 that will actually come and park. Them. But now, the, 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 the mother of all has come. Lagos State Government has provided several, I think about 10 to 12 acres, acres of land being developed. It will be so massive that when you are coming, you could come with your trucks and park while you are assessing the port after the clearance from MPA. MPA is the owner of the port. They will allow trucks that they want to allow inside their power. We don't have a problem about that. But we are talking about the roads of Lagos State. Mm. I, I get a sense um, uh, that some of these, pardon me, some of these parks don't have enough capacity to, that, that's why you're making provision for more. And that might be another part of the conversation or the argument entirely. But I mean, let's, let's come back to this, this issue of you know, diversion, especially for the Eco Bridge, because we have taken a lot of turns before getting there. So what is the plan really to reduce? Because we have the Third Mainland, we have the Carter Bridge, then the Eco Bridge. There's a the waterways, perhaps we'll touch on that as well. So what's the traffic diversion like? I know the closures should have started on Saturday. Am I correct? Is that on you already? Yeah, very, very correct. So uh, what is it like now? How I, do we approach? Thank you very much. The government of Lagos State uh, is a proactive government. Immediately we received the notification from the Prime Minister for we have started preparation. If you get to Ujue Legba, after Ujue Legba, before you get to 
before we get to Alaka, while ascending the Eco Bridge, the gantry has been erected. Massive sign from Ojuelegba from stadium telling you Eco Bridge is now closed. Mind you, it's closed for trailers only. Smaller vehicles can still make use of this bridge. But the trailer, the, the heavy duty trucks are not allowed to make use of this bridge for now, at least in the next six months. So we have provided you will come underneath, you pass through Costain, and then you navigate. You go to wherever you want to go after you have passed through Costain. The place is good. Because the government has made it perfectly okay. So the traffic will be seamless. So the country, unfortunately, we erected this country on Saturday before we woke up on Sunday. Deliberately or otherwise, the trucks have damaged it. So by the time you get to Alaka now, under, under, under the bridge of Alaka, that gantry is there because I erect another one so massive that uh, it will not be possible or difficult for uh, trucks to damage it. But there is massive sign for you to know before you even ascend the Eco Bridge, before you get to Alaka, that the Eco Bridge is not usable for every duty trucks now. But like I said, the smaller vehicles can still make use of this bridge in the next six months. But the diversion is very, very unique. And then we have populated the routes to be taken by every Just duty. to be clear, just to be clear, before we go to Abuja. The road, the, the bridges are shut only for heavy duty vehicles. Yes. Smaller vehicles can still use the roads, yes. the, the bridges, yes. while it is closed, yes. while the repairs are going on. Yes. How is that happening? Very good. The road is wide. So if the road is like this, and then the, uh, that line to be repaired, cut across that place. So they will open up a line while they are cutting up this side. They are repairing it. And then our men, the last man, uh, ever, the ever responsive and uh, responsible last man, are there in their tents to divert. So when you are coming, this is the road, for instance. Half of this place will be open for the smaller vehicle to go. Why this side is for the repair. As soon as they finish this side, they will come over here and then we divert the smaller vehicle to go through this line. It's very, very easy. It's our job. We do it seamlessly. And I can assure you, the traffic will not be so worrisome. It won't cause any heart attack. I'm allaying the fear of everybody. We will be there. We will be there. Last man are there. Saturday, Sunday, last man are there. So that is how it's going to work. By the time you are coming, you will not ascend. Every duty truck will not be allowed to ascend a co bridge for now. Instead, they will use. Uh, underneath costing, they will come and go to turn your lights and then you navigate the port. Okay. Mark. Well, thankfully, you know, the current minister for works and housing is a former governor of the state. So I'm sure if you, there's anyone who will understand what the problems are, he certainly will. And, uh, you know, we understand that Eco Bridge is over 40 years old and this maintenance uh, were long overdue. So I, I'd like to know, looking at the many more bridges that Lagos has, <clears throat> let's say in its custody and also for its use, which are supposed to be maintained by the federal government, are you able to cooperate uh, with them to ensure that at least, you know, there is maybe a schedule of maintenance for these bridges because you will have duty to ensure that your citizens and the residents in Lagos are safe and, and that, you know, the bridges are repaired as and when you, and they also have duty to ensure that uh, the bridges are maintained in good time as well. So I would like you to speak a little to your cooperation uh, with the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing. Thank you very much. We will cooperate with Federal Ministry of Works and every other agency of federal government. And then you could see that so far, we have never had any kind of uh, conflict between states and federal government. That is to testify. That is a testimony that the legal state government is responsive and we are very, very ready to cooperate with anyone. This is development. These are states. So we will not do anything to rob is a good intention of our government to bring development into our states. 
So we are complementing their effort. That is why we have taken it upon ourselves to ensure their own work is even seamless. You will see us all over the place controlling traffic to make the duty of the contractors much more easier. So we are co co cooperating with them and we shall continue to cooperate with them. There is no problem about that at all. We, we appreciate if you come Do you have over. any areas where you would like the federal government to put a little more focus on? I know that Lagos for a long time has been asking for special status being a former federal capital territory and it's sad that you know uh, lawmakers have not seen reason to, 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 you know, to grant that. But in the meantime um, are there areas where you are asking the federal government to pay a little more attention to, especially in the area of infrastructure and what has been their response to that? Thank you very much. Well, Lagos states deserve a special stature, but if they are not same reason with us now, at the allotted time, that time will definitely come. So Lagos state is a melting point. Every one of them comes to Lagos for one reason or the other. So at the allotted time, that one shall be achieved, I can assure you that. So we want the federal government in the area of water, the Newa issue need to be looked into very clearly. Lagos State government want to do a lot on water. But if the governor of Lagos State is bringing money to do much work on water, and then an agency of federal government saying, this is our duty, this is our duty. Well, so we need their cooperation. We want the NEWA issue to be settled for the benefit of everyone. We want our water transportation to be seamless. So we want their cooperation. Also on the federal roads in Lagos. Lagos State is a melting point. We want their constant intervention to ensure the roads are good in Lagos State. And so they want us to come over, they should inform Lagos State Governor right. to go ahead to do it so that there won't be any problem. And then they refund. Wow. We're, 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 we're winding down now in about 30 seconds. You talked about LASMA. You said the ever-responsible LASMA earlier on. And I just want to know quickly uh, how you're dealing with all the complaints from Lagosians. In fact, people from outside Lagos as well that come to Lagos uh, concerning LASMA about their mode of arrest sometimes without cause, extortion and the rest. I wonder first, have you gotten these complaints and how are you taking them on board? Because for me, I've gotten a lot and I'm not even an, an official of government. Thank you very much. I will not sit down here to say there is no bad ex among last month. Likewise, other agency in Nigeria. But we are working towards bringing them. Now, as, I'm, as I speak to you, last month is much more responsible and responsive. And uh, let me quickly give you this uh, example. While we were young in school, our greatest enemy were our teachers. But now we are, because we pop, we pass in line. So last month is correct. Isn't it? We don't want to do thing in a modern way. You want old way. You want to wait on the road, greeting your friends, not minding people coming. So when we are arrested, it's last month that has So surrendered. essentially you're saying the yes. people themselves have a responsibility. Yes. Okay. Yes. We have to thank you very much for now. This conversation is only just starting. Luato Fainka is Special Advisor to the Governor of Lagos State on Transport. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, we have your own feedback on the conversations we have had so far. Let's begin with this one by Dixon on the Russia invasion. It says, the Russian war in Ukraine has exposed the weaknesses of the West and the Nigerian leaders should learn from it. The Ukrainian president has been calling and crying for help, but the real help hasn't come as no one is ready to engage Russia in a warfare citing devastating consequences. We need to come back home and rebuild our defense structure in Nigeria. It shows that being a member of the African Union or the United Nations may not guarantee one's existence, but the capacity to defend one's sovereignty. Our leaders should work on our sovereign existence by equipping our military and defense structure to the teeth as no one is ready to defend another anymore. And now to tweet. Uh, take a look at this one from uh, Professor Monica and I are saying if our tertiary institutions are properly funded, Less us to strike and adequate security in our schools is guaranteed. Ukraine wouldn't be an educational destination for Nigerians. The government must evacuate all willing Nigerians who want to come home. 
This last two from Undubisi and Festus. Um, Undubisi says, each time I watch the needless suffering of the innocent children, the sick, the elderly, the women, and the men of Ukraine, I see the pointlessness and uselessness of war. While we thank Nigerian government, our citizens in Sumi must be saved. And Festus Akimboyewa says, truth is many of our students still trapped in Ukraine and those evacuated from Ukraine are experiencing many powerful emotions. But it seems many of them have a high tolerance level. Those still in Ukraine should be optimistic that they too will be evacuated safely. And that's certainly our prayer here, that all those who are trapped, particularly Nigerians, Nigerian students who are trapped in Sumi, that a safe corridor opens up for them shortly. Uh, we'll certainly all, we urge all Nigerians to keep our students. Uh, we should all pray for them in whatever religion we believe, in whatever faith we profess. Thank you so much for watching this morning, and thank you for your very kind feedback. I'm Mao Kweogu Yusuf. I'm Kaya Kikiolu. Just to let you know that that Abakiari case is on and um, the courts are open to take that on already and more of that, of course, you'll get here at Channels Television. In the meantime, I'm Ayo Makini. Have a wonderful rest of your day.